Okay, let me put it down. All right. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our workshop on helping a friend. Um, my name is Sarah Bisek. I am the Director of Counseling and Psychological Services and also Disability Services. Lucien, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Lucine Hambartumian. I'm a master level psychologist and group therapy coordinator. And today uh, with Sarah, we will provide workshop, like one of the series of our multiple workshops. Great. Okay, so get us started. Okay, to get us started, we wanted to go over some lists of how you will know when something is wrong. So again, we're really wanting to talk today about how to be able to help our friends. Um, in, in the best of the times, we all go through stressors um, that can impact our mental health, and we want to be able to be there to help our friends who might be struggling. And especially right now, when there's so many different unknowns and stressors out there, I think it's really um, easy to say that there's probably a lot of individuals experiencing some stress um, on their mental health, and it could really benefit from being able to have some support and outreach from their friends. One of the first steps to really be able to help individuals figuring out how do I even know if something is wrong? So we have a list of things here that I think are some pretty obvious things and maybe some things we hadn't thought about that could be red flags that maybe one of our friends or our family members are struggling right now. So I think um, an obvious one is if you have a friend or family member or someone you know threatening to kill themselves um, or talking about making plans to kill themselves, that is definitely a red flag that something's going on and that we need to be able to get them some assistance. Um, some other things can be some extreme out of control risk-taking behaviors. So what I say kind of related to this is really any behavior that is out of character for the individual could be a red flag that something's going on with them and it might be really warranted just to be able to reach out and do a quick check-in to see how they are doing. Um, an overwhelming fear for no reason um, so again, they might just feel really anxious, they might be really worried, um, they may not be engaging in the same type of activities they used to. Now again, we want to also make this preface that a lot of people aren't engaging in activities they used to because of social distancing. So we're talking about the individual who used to be the life of the party, always extroverted, always talking, and now you're having those Zoom meetups or meet up at the park with six feet social distancing, and they're not showing up or when they do show up, they're really quiet or withdrawn. Maybe they look disheveled. Um, maybe they look like they haven't slept in a couple of days. All of those can be warning signs, again, of that change in behavior. Um, I think the obvious one is if you see someone not eating or know that they're throwing up or using laxatives to try to lose weight, that is definitely a red flag that something's wrong. Um, any big, severe changes in their mood. Um, repeated use of drugs or alcohol. Now I've had some individuals ask me a little bit more about what this looks like. I'm sure many of you are aware um, that research right now coming out of at least drinking alcohol in the United States is actually showing that us during this quarantine um, have been consuming a lot of alcohol. And so I think it's really important to really be able to look at what my consumption of alcohol is and is that normal? Is that healthy? Am I using that as a way to try to cope and distract myself? Those all could be red flags that a person is struggling. Um, I think I went over the drastic changes in behavior, um, but sleeping habits as well. So if an individual is not sleeping a lot, or maybe they're sleeping all day, every day, every time you call them or text message, they say, oh, I'm in bed. Oh, I'm in bed, no matter what time of day it is. That can definitely be a red flag that there might be something going on. Um, having difficulty concentrating um, or being able to stay still or paying attention to a conversation. So really like just being kind of absent-minded, not really in tune. Those can also be red flags that things are going wrong. Um, and the last one that I really wanna highlight on here is some type of self-harming behavior. So a person might not tell us that they're engaging in self-harming behavior, but maybe you're at that park and it's 90 degrees out like it is today and they're wearing long sleeves. You start to wonder, why are they wearing long sleeves in 90 degree heat? Huh, I wonder what's going on with that. Well, that could be a way of them trying to hide some of those different self-harming behaviors. My biggest kind of rule that I go by is if you have a thought that maybe something's going on, it's not gonna hurt to ask a person, hey, are you okay? You know, so even if they say, well, I'm fine, you know, why? You say, well, you know, I was just concerned for fill in the blank reason. 
and they're not going to get angry about that. Again, it's showing that you care. So even if it is not terrifying, they didn't realize that those things were going on, it gives them that insight. And it also shows to them that you are a safe person that they could be able to talk to if at some point something is going on. So the next question I get is, all right, Sarah, I have realized that you know there's some reasons to be concerned for my friend or my roommate or my family member, but I'm not a therapist, so how do I even begin this conversation? Um, well, the first thing I like to put out there is we're not expecting anyone to be a therapist. Actually, later on in this presentation, Lucinda's going to go over about the importance of setting boundaries and making sure that you understand what your lane and role is, and it is not to be someone's therapist. Your job is to be someone's friend, family member, peer, just be able to start having conversations. So really keep that in mind with the, the rest of suggestions that we're going to go over related to how to start those conversations. So I already mentioned one part, is starting the conversation can be as easy as just sharing your observations or your concerns. The example we have here is, I've noticed you're sleeping more, eating less. Is everything okay? You know, sometimes people aren't aware that they have these changes in their behavior or aren't really putting two and two together that, mm, you know, I haven't been feeling really well lately, have been in bed a lot, haven't been eating much, huh, you know, maybe something really is going on. So sharing that observation is a very non-judgmental, non-confrontational way of showing, I'm just concerned and I want to be able to make sure everything's okay. If you are concerned, even more so, you're not sure how to be able to kind of start that, you can reach out to someone you trust to be able to kind of discuss, hey, I've noticed this about my friend, I'm concerned, you know, I want to be able to make sure I get this right. Can, can we talk about some ways to be able to have this conversation? that can absolutely be a great way to be able to practice that conversation before you start. Also offering just support any way you can. Remembering you are not there to, be able to solve a problem for a person. Trust in the fact that if you jump into problem solving, that person's not gonna feel heard. And they've probably thought of those solutions beforehand and are probably just gonna shut down because of the overwhelming emotions that they're really feeling. The best thing you can be able to do is just listen to a person and then ask them, how can I best support you right now? Surprisingly, a lot of the times the best way that you can really support a person and what they're going to tell you is, I just needed someone to be able to talk to about this. That listening without judgment, without trying to jump to problem solving can absolutely do wonders for a person and be able to get them the help that they need. So some tips. So let's say that you've had this conversation. Oh. Oh, okay, sorry, it, ju it jumped again. I think we're having some technical issues with that piece of it, but yes. So the other things on the other slide were making sure you're doing that conversation in a private place. So when I've done this um, kind of talk with faculty and staff who wanna know how they can best help students, a conversation or a question that we have often come up with saying, hey, we work as a team and we've all noticed this change in this student worker and we wanna be able to show our support. So is it okay if we all go to this person and tell them, we're concerned to notice this. You know, we all see those intervention television shows and such. Uh, my, my suggestion is no. Imagine yourself in that situation. Imagine yourself as someone who's maybe struggling with anxiety right now or feeling a little down lately. And all of a sudden you have six people come into your space and say, we're all concerned, we're here to help. Although that intention sounds really great, the reality is it might be really overwhelming and cause that individual to kind of shut down. But let's say maybe your whole group of friends has noticed these changes in that friend. Our suggestion is really to identify one person to be able to have that conversation. And they can absolutely share saying, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so and so -and -so also, you know, want to be able to say that they, they're concerned about you and that they're here to be able to talk. And being able to say, hey, you know, I would love to be able to bring them into this conversation if you would feel comfortable. Again, giving that power back to the individual to kind of find out what their comfort level is. Maybe that group support is exactly what that person needs, but maybe it isn't. So starting with that one-on-one -on -one approach and moving forward from there. So let's say you have this conversation now and some tips of moving forward with that conversation. Making sure that you're checking in regularly. This isn't a one and done thing. This isn't, oh, thanks for telling me that you're anxious. Thanks for telling me that you're struggling right now all right, I'm, I'm not going to do anything at all anymore. Oh, we keep being, it keeps skipping. Can we skip back to that other slide? Sorry. Yeah. 
Okay, so just making sure that you're calling or texting your friend to check in with them, maybe once or twice a week. Um, you know, if you know that they've decided that they're gonna start some counseling appointments, checking in afterwards and saying, how did it go? Now, we're not suggesting that you say, well, what did you talk about? What did the therapist say? Asking for that play-by-play -play of a therapy session. Just being able to show that, hey, I remember that this was something you had scheduled and I care. You know, that I want to make sure that you were able to connect and, and, you know, get the support that you needed it can really do a lot of wonders for an individual who is struggling. So again, including your friend in the plan. I mentioned earlier, our goal is to empower a person, not tell them what they need to be able to do. So when you're having that conversation of what's the next step, you know, saying, well, this is what you need to do, A, B, C, and D. Although that superman or superwoman or superperson kind of instinct kicks in, try to fight against that instinct and really saying, okay, what can we do now? We is a really powerful word. It means that you're in this with them, but you're not taking over as the person in charge. You're in this together. That can make a person who's feeling really isolated and alone feel that they're not in this alone anymore, that you are a team going to be working together to figure out what plan is going to be best for your friend. Learn more about a mental health condition. So let's say that the person that your, your friend discloses, well, they have major depression. You can obviously ask, you know, what is that like for you as an individual? You know, you can inquire, but you can also go out and do your research yourself. You might have a little bit of better understanding what your friend is going through. And not expecting you to become an expert in the area or become a therapist, but showing that you care enough to do a little bit of research can also send a really great message to your friend already mentioned avoiding using judgment or dismissive terms. And we sometimes don't realize that our terms or what we're saying is judgmental or dismissive. One thing I often hear people say is, well, you know, it's not that bad. You'll get through this. Again, and it's said with the best intentions that you're trying to think positively and cheerlead. But it also really dismisses the person's lived reality. To them, hearing it's not that bad makes it maybe feel like, oh, well, they don't really understand what I'm going through, or, ooh, maybe I'm overreacting, and that's why they're saying this. Again, we don't know. So avoiding those type of mm, cheerleading type behaviors might be really helpful. Just listen. Also support treatment. So as we mentioned, we're not expecting you to be a therapist, but helping the person maybe get in contact with the therapist could be really helpful. So different things you could be able to do is offer the person, you know, 1-800-SUICIDE phone number. Um, if the student is, or the friend of yours or family member is a student, um, either at University of Michigan Dearborn or at another institution, um, most of those places do have counseling appointments. Um, so you can be able to contact and help that person get connected to counseling services. So let's say they're not connected to a university. How can you be able to help them get connected to therapy? In the state of Michigan, I always recommend people calling 411, not 911, 411. It's a great way to be able to get some different resources that are available in your community where a person can be able to connect with therapy quickly. Again, if the person's feeling a little bit more highly motivated, definitely calling out their insurance can be a way to be able to get connected to it. But a lot of times when we're feeling really anxious or down, it's hard to get that motivation to take that step, even when we know that's the step that we need. So sometimes having that friend saying, okay, well, here's some resources to get you connected. You know, therapy is going to be really helpful for you. I'm still here to support you. And I'm glad you told me about this. And I want to be able to make sure you get to experts who are trained to be able to get you the best help you need. It can be a really powerful way to be able to help an individual. All right. Now we're going to move forward with a, a short video that I found. Hopefully it will work that kind of shows a little bit about helping, helping friends. When you think of your mental health journey, what it comes to mind? <laughs> what a question. I think when people hear, remember to take care of your mental health, they think that everyone else is, and that's not at all accurate. You know, for me, I'm trying to learn still to make sure that I stay okay, you know what I'm saying? But um. I just answered like 40 questions in one. That's great. It doesn't make you weak to ask for help. It doesn't. It doesn't make you weak to ask for a friend, to go to a therapist. It shouldn't make you feel weak to 
to ask anyone for help and you should be able to ask anyone for help and everyone has to help someone if they need it. You know, starting that conversation, you don't have to make it super serious right away. You know, you, you, you say, how are you feeling? Like, are you okay? That's what you say, are you okay? Ask somebody, that's what they, you know, and yeah, I'm good. Really? You know, are you actually good? Like, sometimes you don't even have to say anything to someone for them to know they understand. And they don't have to say anything to you. Sometimes it's about a hug. <laughs> about somebody holding you and telling you, not even telling you anything, that's what I'm saying. Holding you. The main thing I'm trying to say is that you should keep your ears open and you should listen. And I'm just dealing with it how I'm dealing with it and I'm, I'm trying my best. Obviously I'm not a trained professional in anything. I, am, I don't know what I'm doing half the time. But I have, I have seen it and I have I've been it. And even if it's just a little bit more comfort, that can really mean a lot to someone because you don't know what is going on. Even in that moment, there could be something going on. And it's been like that for me. There have been certain people that, that have texted me right when I needed to be texted, you know, saying they loved me and that they were thinking about me. And, and, it, and it, it really means a lot. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental health, you can get more information at seizetheawkward.org. Okay, I hope that that kind of helps individuals if they're on that fence about starting that conversation about the power um, that really can come from just saying, hey, are you okay? And so I will turn it over to Lucinda to kind of talk a little bit more about some different skills you can be able to use when having that conversation. Thank you, Sarah. It was really great uh, movie, short video, because uh, things what uh, this young uh, woman was sharing, like having, uh, please have an open ears, simply be present there and sometimes even silence, like you can be there and give a hug, it really helps. Because when we're talking about listening, uh, it's how active we are listening. Because we know that active listening, be able to be active, it involves all our senses. Like we really need to be present. We really need to be mindful to help our friends or someone who wants to talk with us to show that we're available. And we really care about him or her and we would like some way to support. And as we know, listening is very fundamental component of interpersonal communication skills. Like it's a foundation for everything. And when we're able to really develop the skill being a good listener, we can benefit in many, many areas of our life. It can improve our relationship. We can have a much better relationship with our coworkers. Like we can be more productive. And in different social situations, we also may feel like we are always there, we are present. But we, at the same time, we also need to understand which kind of um, obstacles are there for listening. Sometimes it, uh, people show like they are bored, they are not interested, but you would like to share, or they can have their internal issues when they feel like mentally they are not ready for this type of conversation or they simply can be preoccupied, or it can be some type of environmental destructions going on in their life, or type of the perception they have. They feel like they cannot simply be and listen. And sometimes they are uh, having difficulties to be active listener because they have this, uh, we can call like red flag words. Sometimes people hear some type of words and they are having reaction it, because it some way uh, links with their internal issues and they feel like that's it they lost that connection what was happening during conversation because they started to worry about their internal issues or 
they started to feel more vulnerable and sensitive. And it's okay. It's okay to be honest with yourself and with your friend when they talk, because you can mention that I notice, like sometimes when we talk about important thing or not as much important things when I would like to provide my support. Every time when you're using this type of words or sentences, it really affecting and I'm not able to really be open and listen to you. And also sometimes attention span, when one of our friends, you feel like they are really busy, something is going on and they cannot give your family member their attention. Maybe it's better to talk later when both you can find that quiet place and be together and maintain that conversation. And we also need to remember that for us, uh, listening has, how I mentioned, it's so uh, fundamental because it helps us to obtain information. It helps us to understand many things when we are listening. It helps us to learn because during our life, we, we are always learning. Always we are le learning about relationship, we are learning about life, we are learning about social justice. And we also need to remember that listening can also help us to have enjoyment, depend what you are listening. That's why it's important to develop those skills. But before we will move toward verbal listening, I would like to bring to your attention, and I'm more than sure all of you know this, but it's nice to uh, repeat again and uh, be aware that our nonverbal listening, active listening is also very, very important. If we want, if someone will feel comfortable and uh, trustful toward us, we need to try to show non-verbally that we are really there and we are listening to them. The way how we are keeping our eye contact, the way how we can move like our head or even entire body posture, the smile, and sometimes even mirroring like what you are uh, listening non-verbally or verbally during conversation. Because we need to remember that 80% of information is coming from nonverbal uh, language. And it's very important for us, for human beings, because this is historically how we were developed before we started to use language and moving toward more advanced verbal level. But the first nonverbal is extremely strong for us and we need to try to practice this. And this will make our friends and family members and co-workers more comfortable when they are interacting with us. Now, when we're talking about uh, verbal signs of active listening, it's very important to try to practice positive reinforcement. If you're able to show it like your positive encouragement for someone who talks with you, definitely they will feel uh, more comfortable sharing with you what is going on in their life or simply being able to talk about different issues, not only about problems, what they have, but with our friends, we definitely would like to show where they're and positive reinforcement is very important. And during conversation, what is presented, it's really important to be able to remember what your friends is uh, sharing with you. And how I mentioned, like you're, you're mindfully there, you're actively there, like all your senses are there during this conversation. And you're able to use questioning because it will help to have some kind of clarification. And those questionings, they need to be very supportive. Sometimes it can be open-ended, sometimes it can be close-ended, and sometimes it can be some type of question that it's leading. And it can be also a type of the question that you feel like you're reflecting and you're giving back that information that was presented by your friends, but you're using different words and they feel like, yeah, I'm sharing and I'm not lonely here simply talking. My friend is attuned. My friend is present. My friend is with me. That's why it's really important to try to practice like reflection, paraphrasing, clarification and trying to make summary what was presented like this is what I'm hearing from you this is what we can do in this situation or even sometimes you feel like you don't have any solution for some kind of issue that is presented but trying to make a summary what was presented and showing that you are there because even sometimes venting process is also important that your friend knows that they can vent 
in life. Unfortunately, it's not always that we have answers for everything. We also need to try to understand okay, what I can do for my friend if my friend is facing this type of issues in life. Now, when we are talking about uh, listening, I would like to share some tips for uh, practicing active listening. Important thing, when someone talks with you, please don't interrupt. Let them to present what they would like to present. And if you have some kind of internal uh, dialogue or conversation happening inside you, please shut down your internal um, conversations with your own self. Simply be open, be neutral, and withhold your judgment. Because sometimes we have our stigmas, we have our uh, uh, perception about some situation. You, you don't need to use your perception. You need simply be there for your friend and trying to be neutral as much as possible and be open-minded. Observe and be careful, watch for how Sarah mentioned, try to watch and see the signals. And here I'm going to repeat again, check for, uh, be observant and watch for facial expression. I mentioned for like nonverbal active listening because our facial expression may give us a lot of information tone of the voice or other behaviors that your friend is representing or someone during that conversation because it will give you a lot of information what is going on it's not always easy for us to use right words when we are going through a difficult time in our life and present those right words and sometimes observe not sometimes like actively observing what uh, your uh, friend is experiencing can help you to understand how later when everything will be presented you can lead and help them empathize be very empathetic it's very important when people can experience that when they are sharing other side has empathy for them and they have understanding what is happening be patient if you feel like your uh, how I mentioned like uh, someone was uh, using some kind of red flag words and it affecting your own reactions, be patient and be honest with yourself. Oh, I am experienced, like I'm reacting this way because of those words, but you don't need to take those things personally because someone is talking with you and they are sharing. And later on, you can mention about those red words that they're always some way affecting on you show interest by asking questions because you're not simply silent there when you notice like this conversation is moving and you reach that point when it's right to ask questions because you will you will be able to reflect you will be able to show that you're actively there ask those questions and avoid abruptly changing the subject because sometimes when we talk with people when someone is reaching type of the point when they feel uncomfortable. They don't know how they will lead this conversation and support. They can abruptly change the subject, which shows they are also not comfortable. Maybe they are also reaching that level of being defensive, but you don't need to do this. You can later work with your own feelings and thoughts. And again, don't try to solve the problems. We need to remember, it's not always that we have answers for those problems and you're not solving them. You're simply trying to be active, supportive listener, empathetic listener who can be there for their friends because it's so beautiful in video, the young lady mentioned, be there sometimes, even being silently there, simply giving the hug, it means a lot for our friends or loved one, family members, and even coworkers when they are going through some uh, difficult time in their life and be able uh, to practice those things. Again, it being aware about your internal issues. Always be also careful what you're experiencing, what is happening with you. Now, another important part uh, for everyone in relationship, any type of relationship, it's very important to be able uh, to set healthy boundaries. 
And because we know that boundaries is everywhere in life. And if we're able to set right boundaries, it means we will have healthier relationship, healthier interaction. That's why it's so important. And sometimes it takes years and experience and emotional maturity to reach that level, being able to maintain that healthy boundary. One of the things, what is very important, one of the aspects, like be self-aware who you are, how is the relationship, and which type of relationship you would like to have. Be clear about your needs and expectations. Because if you're staying silent, if you're not sharing what is happening, how do you feel about some situations, it's going to get deeper and your frustration or disappointment and even maybe some kind of resentfulness is going to get unmanageable and it will create uh, some kind of uh, misunderstanding and bumps in relationship. Be specific and direct. If you're noticing that some type of situation is always repeating because you were silent, you didn't want to talk about this thinking that your friend or family member will feel uncomfortable, but it's important to be very specific and mention that I notice like this is what is happening always and I'm not ready for this type of relationship. It's very important to talk. Communicate your thoughts with each other. Because when people, again, I don't want if someone will think like we are mind readers. We are not the mind readers. And the people, they cannot know what is going on. If you're happy or not happy with some situation, that's why it's very important to communicate. Never assume or guess feeling of others. Because when we are assuming, again, it may be your, um, it can be our own thoughts and our feelings and reactions. It's very important to clearly talk instead of assuming. And if you're noticing something, don't make overgeneralization. Try to use I statement telling, this is what I'm experiencing. This is what I'm feeling about this situation or I'm noticing in our relationship. Not like overgeneralization because it may be your own experience. And other side, your significant one or your friend, they need to know about this. Try to take responsibility for your action. If you're doing something wrong, you need to be honest. You need to be able to apologize. You need to honestly tell that I was wrong acting this way, or I was wrong when I was taking our conversation in wrong direction or always avoiding to have important conversation that will help us to improve our relationship. And very important for everyone, it's a friendship, it's a romantic relationship, any type of relationship, be able to have that time and space when you have your private time and private space. Because we need some we need to have some time. It helps us to clarify everything what is happening. It helps us to regain our energy. You cannot, especially those days when we work from home, uh, we are studying from home, everything is happening in the, in the same space. That's why it's very important to talk and be able to find the time. And sometimes you don't want to feel like you're manipulated when someone is forcing you in direct way or direct way to do something that you don't want to do because you feel like you're experiencing sense of guilt or you feel like you may be embarrassed because what other friends can think about you. Like sometimes young people, they share like they don't want to participate in some kind of party or event but they feel like their friends may get upset even they don't feel like they, they are ready to participate or they had some kind of negative experience because someone was drunk or some kind of things were happening. Now they, they have the sense of pressure. They need to be there. You need to talk and you need to explain and much better to be honest and tell, sorry, I cannot be there or I don't like this because I was noticing like you're manipulating or you're trying to control situation because sometimes people can be very rigid. They have difficulties being flexible. They are trying to do everything the same way. Like, for example, working with um, clients, we hear that sometimes they feel their friends get upset because they don't want to do their way or they feel like their friends is constantly uh, dictating like 
uh, always the same approach in relationship. If you feel like someone is controlling you or someone is manipulating or someone is assuming something, you need to talk because this type of relationship is going to face more conflicts and more misunderstanding than you need to have. That's why it's always good to communicate. It's always good to be active listener. And it's possible trying to reduce your defenses because you don't know how other side is experiencing. Like you will be able to present what you're experiencing, but you also need to be able to listen and be aware about the other side, maintain that those healthy boundaries. When people know about their um, needs and expectations, it's easier to maintain healthy boundaries. I think probably this is what I was trying to present about boundaries and active listening. And if anyone has any questions, uh, we would like to go over and check. But right now, I don't see any questions. Sorry. <laughs> no, I don't see any questions. Um, but again, those of you that, you know, if you are live and have a question, please go ahead and um, type it in the chat. For those of you who are watching this video not live as a recording, um, if you do have questions about any of the things we talked about, or if you're struggling with a, a certain situation or trying to help a friend and feel that you have some more follow-up questions, um, we are always available to be able to serve as a consultation resource for you as well. We're going to talk through some different options that you might have to be able to help a friend or a family member. Um, so you can see on the slide right now, you can always be able to reach us right now by e um, email. You can email the umdearborncats at umich.edu with any questions that you might have, or if you want to set up a time to do a consultation about um, maybe a situation that you're in and wanting to make sure that you're getting some, giving the best support that you can for a friend or family member, um, that is the best way to be able to reach us right now. Um, we are working on getting our phone lines transferred um, to our homes as well as we work remote, but that is still in process. So right now, the best way to be able to consult with us would be to email to set up a time. Um, and as I, I put on the slide here, that even if, uh, if the person that you're trying to assist isn't a student, we can still be able to help you find resources. Um, really, I think, I think it's safe to say that all of us as mental health clinicians um, at CAPS went into this field to be able to help people. Um, and if we're not going to say, oh, that person's not registered, so we're not going to be able to help them find resources. No, we'll still definitely help you um, to be able to try to find those resources um, to be able to help your friend or family member. All right, well, I don't see any questions um, during the live recording in the chat. So I think that wraps us up for this afternoon. But again, um, feel free to be able to email us if you have any questions or concerns, or maybe you want to set up counseling yourself. We are still doing the counseling sessions for all registered students um, via telehealth. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, and um, take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. And please try to practice active listening, good communication, and learning to maintain healthy boundaries. Again, it takes time. It takes experience. And even if you have done mistakes, that's okay. Our mistakes help us to learn what we need to improve and what needs to be changed. Thank you very much. And have a great day and weekend and July 4th. <laughs>